Welcome to Baseball Seasons 1971. Greatness in the game. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! Fair ball. Great play by Robinson. Look at that! Oh! Great day in the morning. What a play! With Brooks Robinson's iconic 1970 World Series performance still fresh in everyone's mind, the Orioles entered the 1971 season as a favorite to reach their third straight World Series. I don't think anybody really thought about defending the World Championship. We just figured that we would do exactly what we did in 69 and 70, and then we were probably going to end up uh, in the World Series. And when you played for Earl Weaver, it was all about winning. For Earl Weaver of Baltimore, two pennants in as many full seasons as manager. He expected a lot, but on the other hand, I think most of us understood that if Earl was going to be the manager, that come October, we would be playing in the postseason. On the heels of two consecutive 100-plus win seasons, the Orioles' addition of righty Pat Dobson bolstered an already formidable staff. The Orioles could have four 20-game winners this year. McNally, Cuellar, Palmer, and now Pat Dobson. And while the O's represented baseball's old guard in the AL East, the Western Division Oakland Athletics were ushering in a younger, hipper, 70s look. Their Maverick owner, Charlie Finley, wanted his team to stand out from the pack. We had these white shoes before Joe Namath had white shoes. We had these colorful uniforms. While other teams had a gray uniform on the road and a white uniform at home. We had all kind of the multicolored uniform configuration that you could think of. And this colorful break in tradition seemed to suit the city of Oakland perfectly. They had a lot of political unrest going on in Oakland. They had the Black Panthers were at their height of being who they were at that time. You had Berkeley, which was adjacent to Oakland. You had the Vietnam conflict still going on. So we had this one common bond, which was you went to see the Oakland A's play, or you played for the Oakland A's. New manager Dick Williams was four years removed from delivering the Red Sox to an impossible Dream World Series berth. In 1971, he was hoping for a similar outcome as his young team appeared on the rise. It was a pretty good club, and it was basically built from uh, guys that had come through the organization together. No question, Oakland was on the move. With position players like Burt Campanaris, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando, and Joe Rudy, and future Hall of Famers Catfish Hunter and Raleigh Fingers headlining the pitching staff. These guys had a lot of talent, and they just kind of gelled and came together during the 71 season. With just a little help provided by a 21-year-old pitching phenom with the most colorful name. Over in the National League East, the Pittsburgh Pirates were also poised for a successful 71 campaign, having just come off their first postseason appearance in a decade. See, in 70, we came off of a championship season. We got beaten in the playoffs by the Reds, and we felt that we had an opportunity to get back there. Three future Hall of Famers brought leadership to the Bucks: second baseman Bill Mazeroski, slugger Willie Stargell, and the multi-dimensional Roberto Clemente. He and Stargell and Mazeroski were great examples of how to go about your craft. If you watched them, you couldn't help but notice how they went about their work. I always considered them to be my professors at the University of Baseball. And uh, if you couldn't learn from them, you couldn't learn from anybody. Danny Murtaugh, the Dean of Pirate U, had guided Pittsburgh to a championship in 1960. Now he hoped his tenured core, sprinkled with an influx of talented underclassmen, could once again become World Series. We had been stocking up our minor league system, so going into 1971, we knew that we were a good baseball team. Meanwhile, there was a different kind of excitement in eastern Pennsylvania. Philadelphia opens its new veteran stadium. Over 55,000 fans turn out to see the Phillies host the Montreal Expos. Right over there. Sit. The first ball was not thrown out. There she goes. It was dropped from the Argo helicopter and caught by Phillies catcher Mike Ryan. Don Money hit the first homer at the vet while future Hall of Famer Jim Bunning recorded the first win. Final score, Philadelphia 4, Montreal 1. A historic day in Philadelphia baseball history. April 27th would be another historic day for baseball, as Hank Aaron joined Babe Ruth and Willie Mays in the 600 Home Run Club. 
mind-boggling was the word that comes to my mind when you start looking at 600. That's hitting 30 home runs for 20 years in a row. When I think of people that influenced the way that I played, Mays was a name that was up there, but right next to him was Hank Aaron. But Willie was still the man. Oh. As Charlie Fox's 1971 Giants were still led by the Say Hey Kid. There's only one Willie Mays. He's the greatest all-around ball player that's ever put on a pair of spikes. But Mays wasn't the lone superstar on a ball club that stockpiled stars. Names like Willie McCovey, Gaylord Perry, and Juan Marichal also graced the Giants roster. It was just an interesting team to be around because of the diverse personalities and the greatness. The 3-2 pitch to McCovey. Swung on him deep to right. Way back, way back. Tell it to you take a team now, any team you want to look at, and find me four Hall of Famers. I don't think you'll be able to do that. That talent that had propelled the Giants to a National League best 902 wins in the 60s, yet only translated into one World Series appearance. The Giants had ended the decade with five straight second place finishes and began the 70s by finishing third. After the 62 series, we thought we'd win it every other year. But the 71 team, by then, Marischal, McCovey, and Mays were getting old. Despite their aging core, the Giants remained a threat, due in large part to the ascension of their fourth-year right fielder, Bobby Bonds. He was an offensive force player ball club, a kind of guy that you need at the top of your order to jumpstart the team. Bobby's seven April home runs served notice that the giant influx of youth would inspire the team's aging veterans to make one last go at greatness in 71. Looking back in 1971, it would be hard not to notice that certain cultural trends still remain from the celebrated 60s. Hair, for one. Mud clothing was in. Sported by Cleveland Indian Ken the Hawk Harrelson. Of course, the players dug music back then, too, but their iPods of the day were eight track tapes. But to really gauge America and baseball in 71, one would have to look no further than some shocking numbers from a bygone era. A nice new car could cost about $4,000, while the gas to run it was 40 cents a gallon. That same 40 cents could also buy a pack of cigarettes. But beginning in 1971, television ads for them were banned. But of all the numbers related to 71, the most staggering were those posted by starting pitchers. Many still worked out of four-man rotations, and in 1971, the highest percentage of starters in nearly 50 years worked at least 250 innings. Guys were asked routinely to go high in the 200s, and many of them in the 300s, and some of them in the mid-300s. Fergie Jenkins used to go out there and routinely finish just about every game that he was in. Between starts, uh, I would throw batting practice, I would do a lot of running, and that contributed to a lot of that strength, being able to go as long as I did. Jenkins led the league in wins, games started and completed, and also set a career high in innings pitched. Fergie finished the year 11 games over 500 for the third place Cubs, capturing the lone Cy Young Award of his career. I think it kind of told people that Ferguson Jenkins was a pretty good ball player. But Tigers ace Mickey Lolich had the most staggering statistics. Guys a butt, fast man, good play by Lolich. Lolich's 71 pitching resume shouldn't have come as a surprise. After all, Mickey had won game seven of the 68 fall classic by hurling his third complete game of the series on only two days rest. Knowing how fast Mickey worked through strikes, kept the ball down, kept his team in the game, and those amount of innings that you're talking about in one season, <laughs> uh, I don't think you'll see him anymore. With a major league high 25 wins, one might have expected Lolich to be a shoe in for the AL Cy Young. But not so, as one pitcher appeared out of the blue. And here comes this Vita Blue kid from Mansfield, Louisiana, of all places. How do you describe Vita Blue? One way you can describe him, a long, loose arm. Right. He got him on a blazing fastball. 
Vida in 1971, uh, he was phenomenal. The way I feel now, I would predict that I'd win 50 games, you know, just from my physical health. I had just left Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I was in the best shape of my life. After a short visit to the majors in 69, Blue made sure of a long lease by pitching a one-hitter and a no-hitter during his September lookover last year. And those credentials earned him a 1971 opening day start presidential opener in Washington, D.C. I lost to the Washington Senators. I was pitching against a guy named Denny McClain, the last 30-game winner. I obviously was nervous, but after that game, I fell into a groove of what they now call in the zone. Vida completed and won all six of his remaining April starts, three by shutout. With 10 wins by the end of May, Blue propelled the first place A's to a seven-game lead in the AL West. Swing and a miss that Vida Blue fastball. He's getting all his stuff over, and he's in a good groove right now, and there's no telling how many games he'll win. The way he's pitching right now, he might not ever get beat. When you have a team that had a center fielder, Willie Mays, at first base was Willie McCovey, right field was Bobby Bonds, and you had Juan Marichal and Gaylord Perry on the hill. If we can get that third pitcher, we're going to win a pennant. Now, how do you like that? It's good. Good. Brimming with swagger, the Giants stormed from the starting gate by posting an 18-5 April record. We play good. We play good. A lot of hitting, good pitching. The future Hall of Fame duo of Juan Marichal and Gaylord Perry set the tone early as they combined to complete and win their first six April starts. When a Marshall or Gaylord Perry goes out there to pitch, you know you have a great chance in winning. 40-year-old Willie Mays was belying his age by hitting 11 homers by the end of May. Way back, way back, But in case he faltered, the Giants felt they had the next Willie Mays. As a young kid, hearing those things, you know, it was always a compliment to me that people respected my ability, and it made me believe in myself quite a bit because I felt that if people believe that in me, I should be able to believe that in myself. Bonds is a total athlete, hitting, running the bases, or fielding his position. When he came to a team with Mays, and the Giants were looking for a successor, so it was a natural. The pitch is at deep to left field. This one's got a chance. It's going. It's gone. Bobby Bonds hits a three-run homer, and the Giants lead. Bonds was electric in 1971. His 13 home runs through May helped the Giants build a 10 and a half game lead over the Dodgers. The mix of young and old appeared to be meshing. It was a unique team, but a team I think that probably wasn't good enough to ever lead that division by 10 and a half games. But at the end, we wound up winning because Cincinnati wasn't quite ready yet. 71 was indeed a disappointment for the Reds. Fresh off a World Series berth a year prior, Sparky Anderson's bunch had high expectations for the year. Who's the expectation? You can expect all you want, but uh, the game's still gonna be played between the lines. We didn't have the talent to compete that year. Surprisingly, the hitters of the prolific Big Red Machine endured this refrain twice. First, Ken Holtzman of the Cubs no-hit them. And only 20 days later, the Phillies' Rick Wise found a way to top that. Uh, no-hitter and hit two home runs. Wise will lead off. He hit a home run in the fifth, accounting for two of the Phillies' three runs. There's a well-hit ball, deep left field. That might go. It is a home run for Rick Wise's second of the game. He was a good hitter, and he was a great competitor on the mound. Find a ground ball and hit to Harmon. Harmon to Wise, covering. He's one out away from a no-hitter. You pitch a no-hitter against the Cincinnati Reds, you've done a heck of a job. Pete Rose stands in. He's nothing for three. We had battled to the count of three and two, and I was going to go with my best pitch, and that was a fastball. Here's the three-two pitch. Swing a line drive. He did it. Wise has done it. A no-hit, no-run game. Great, great ball game. How do you feel? I feel great. <laughs> Tremendous feeling. I, I can't describe it. <laughs> that was my day in the sun, so to speak. I donated the bat, the ball, and the glove to the Hall of Fame. It's there forever. I'm very proud. 35-year-old Bob Gibson and the Cardinals were equally as proud, commemorating Gibson's August no-hitter versus the Pirates. I would like to give to Bob videotapes and tape recordings of the no-hit game and the designer's rendition of the ring which is being made for Bob to commemorate this event. This event is something that is very important in my life. It always will be. 
Thank you very much. Gibson's 16 wins in 1971 were second best on the Cardinals staff, trailing Steve Carlton's 20. But the Cardinals' story was the MVP year of their man at the hot corner. Playing third base from the St. Louis Cardinals, Joe Torre. In 1969, the Cardinals had traded first baseman Orlando Cepeda to the Braves for catcher Joe Torre. Going over to St. Louis, it was exciting for me, but he puts a ton of pressure on me because Cha Cha had just won an MVP. I know he was a big favorite in St. Louis. In 71, for the first time in his career, Torrey was a full-time third baseman, and the change on defense appeared to bolster his offensive production. He would lead the league with personal bests in hits, RBIs, total bases, and a batting average of 363. Torrey's batting average is even more amazing when you realize he does not have the kind of speed of either a Man Aaron or a Mays. He's got to really hit all of his balls hard and get clean base sets. They say every time at that you get one pitch to hit. That particular year, I wasn't missing that pitch. Behind Torrey's potent bat, the cards would stay in NL East contention for much of 1971. The 1971 All-Star Game took place in Tiger Stadium. And with 20 future Hall of Famers highlighting the rosters, this game would be long remembered. National League manager Sparky Anderson has a lineup he'd like to ride out every day. Willie May, center field. Hank Aaron, right field. Joe Torre, third base. 71 All-Star game in Detroit. I mean, it was a who's who. Frank Robinson, right field. Brooks Robinson, third base. And by the blue pitcher. I had to kind of watch myself because very easily I could walk up and say, will you sign this baseball for me, sir? Two of the top three home run hitters of all time, Mays and Aaron, are hitting number one and two in the National League lineup. Hitting around 360, 370 at the time, I still felt out of place with all those great players, and I'm not trying to say that to be humble. It's just the way I felt at the time. These guys were so much more awesome than I was. The American League, losers of eight straight All-Star games, hoped Vida Blue, awesome himself, with a record 17 wins at the break, could help stop the streak. I don't think any pitcher's ever come into this All-Star game with more pressure. I do remember pitching to Willie Mays, who was my childhood idol, to pitch to Willie Mays in the 1971 All-Star game. That was pretty cool. Ground ball to shortstop. Aparicio up, and Willie Mays is out. Blue retired his idol in a 1-2-3 first, but ran into second inning trouble. Charge on first, one out. One strike to Johnny Bench. There's a high drive to deep right center. That one is going, and it is gone in the upper deck. A tremendous drive by Johnny Bench. Another future Hall of Famer would add to the National League's 2-0 lead in the top of the third. recently found out that the home run Hank Aaron hit was his first extra base hit in all-star competition. Look it up. Henry Aaron gets his first extra base hit, his first all-star homer. <laughs> National League starter Doc Ellis was hoping for his third scoreless inning when he faced the most dangerous pinch hitter. I felt at the time like why was I pinch hitting so early in the game? However, I do remember saying to myself that they're just getting me out of the way because I'm just a young kid. Aparicio on first, nobody out. One ball, two strikes to Reggie Jackson. I remember standing at third base when Doc Ellis threw that pitch to Reggie. There's a long drive. That one is going way up. It is off the roof. I saw that ball take off, and I didn't think it would ever, <laughs> ever land anywhere. That hit the transformer up there. Unfortunately, he hit that transformer up there, which has never been hit before. It kept it from being measured how far that ball would have went. And if it hadn't hit that, it would have gone to China or Australia or somewhere because that was the hardest hit ball I ever saw. A tremendous smash. Only eight players have hit the ball over the roof here in Detroit. And Jackson nearly did it then out of the ballpark. Jackson's blast brought the junior circuit within a run. And then, later in the inning, Frank Robinson also came up with a man aboard. There's a drive, deep right field, back goes Hank Aaron, looks up, it's good. 
Robinson was named the game's MVP as his shot put the American League ahead to stay. But there would be more strokes of power, first by Harmon Killebrew in the sixth inning. It's another two-run homer, and Killebrew has stretched the American League margin to 6-3 to three with the fifth home run of this game. And then Roberto Clemente. It's a high fly to deep right center. Way back, that was going, and it is gone. Almost in the same spot as Johnny Bench. It was a record-tying sixth home run. Now ahead 6-4, to four, Tiger workhorse Mickey Lolich closed things out with a two-inning save. Brooks Robinson makes the call. Breaking their eight-game losing streak, American League manager Earl Weaver had satisfied his passion to win every game his team played. He was cocky. I like that. He was a very confident and intense competitor. He hated to get beat. Hey, let's go. Come on, shake him up. Get back in the game. He instilled in us that we were the best. When we went out on the field, we should be the best. Keep us right in the ballgame, Mike. We'll win the son of a gun. Come on. And we went out there and took the attitude of let's go out there and show the world that we are the best. The Orioles are the class of the American League. 69, we won 109 games. Uh, 1970, we won 108 games. All the more is the world's game. The following year, we won 101 games. So that was a pretty good dynasty. Boo Pow, Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson was there. Robinson slams it into deep left center. Tremendous lineup, veteran players. Mark Belanger, Davey Johnson, and Brooks Robinson flash leather on the infield, while center fielder Paul Blair added a fourth gold glove to the mix. You couldn't hit a ball over Paul Blair's head. You couldn't hit a ball through Davey Johnson or uh, Mark Belanger. As great as the defense was, it was still overshadowed. Because it was the pitching staff. The top winner of the Baltimore staff, Dave McNally, who won 21 games. Did something I don't think will be done again. Palmer's won 11 games. Here's to be headed for another 20-game season. Well, you'd have to put it right up there with the best of all time. And everybody is out of the dugout to congratulate Mike Cuellar. Four 20-game winners. Pat Dobson acquired in an off-season trade from San Diego to strengthen the Baltimore depth. We had contrasting styles in all four of those 20-game winners. Jim had the great fastball. Mike Cuellar, a left-handed screwball pitcher. Got him on the slow ball. Crafty pitching by Mike Cuellar. Pat Dobson was one of the funniest guys you'll ever want to meet. We call him the snake because he had a great overhand curve ball. Breaking ball, he swings and he strikes out. Dave McNally was one of the ultimate competitors. If you needed a win, he was going to be the guy that wanted the baseball. It took me four or five years to really develop good control, and uh, I just got this by repetition, doing it over and over again. It was the best staff that ever pitched in the major leagues. With the Big Four accounting for 81 total wins and over 1,000 innings, the Orioles cruised, winning the American League East by 12 games over the Detroit Tigers. Some 250 miles away, the Pittsburgh Pirates were winning their division using a totally different approach. The 1971 Pirates lineup was a formidable presence, intimidating even the league's best pitching staffs. Leading the NL in runs, hits, homers, and slugging percentage, the 71 Pirates were an offensive machine. We had such good hitters with Clemente and Stargell and Sanguin and Dave Cash, Oliver and Hebner and Robertson. And with that upper cup swing of his, he drove the ball more than 410 feet away. We had a good pitching staff. It might have been a little overshadowed by the fact that we had such a good hitting ball club. And offense is more fun, so it usually gets more attention. There was a team that was really tough offensively. I mean, you took a look at that lineup. The scouting report certainly starts with Clemente and Starch. Those guys were just out of this world. Willie Stargell led the league with 48 homers while knocking in 125 runs. 
Playing left field, he would make a strong case for MVP. I had been watching Willie Stargell since 1960 when I signed, so it was no surprise that he had emerged into the kind of player he had become by the time 1971 came around. By 71, Roberto Clemente also had the resume of an established star. During the 60s, Clemente compiled the decade's highest batting average, 328. When you talk about Roberto, you knew he was a superstar. I mean, there's no question. Clemente had 10 hits in a doubleheader last August against the Dodgers. Yet despite four batting titles, 10 gold gloves, and a world championship to his credit, Clemente felt underappreciated. If he'd have played anywhere else but Pittsburgh, I think you'd certainly hear a lot more about him. A man of at least equal ability, Clemente feels overshadowed by Aaron and Mays. He really resented the fact that he didn't get the publicity as guys like Aaron and Mays and Mantle, but the only thing that he couldn't do that these guys could do was hit with power. Perhaps it was that lack of power, or Clemente's adversarial style with the press that kept him underpublicized. I am very outspoken. So when I feel something that is injustice uh, toward my teammate or somebody else, I want to say something about it. On and off the field, Clemente's commanding presence was impossible to ignore. He had this ability to turn a veteran baseball player into a 10-year-old kid. You never wanted to take your eyes off of him. You didn't want to miss anything he did. Roberto Clemente had become an ambassador for Latin American ball players, much like the great Satchel Paige was for Negro League ball players. And in 1971, Paige became the first player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame by the Negro League Committee. I am the proudest man on earth right today, and I know my wife is. Paige's recognition in August 1971 came a month prior to Clemente and his racially diverse group of teammates making history of another kind. One time this year, Danny Murtaugh started nine blacks, and as he said, when it comes to making out my lineup, my players know I'm not colorblind. Dean Klein's mentioned to me that we had nine black players. I didn't even notice it, and I don't think anybody else on the team noticed it. But at the end of the game, the writers were asking about it, and all of a sudden I found out, wow, you know, Danny and I was on the team and just made history. I'm very proud to be a part of that historic event. Perhaps the Pirates' biggest win in a year they topped their division by seven games over the Cardinals. In 71, I guess you have to say it's been the year of the Oakland A's, the big green machine, the Gallagher Green Giant. We've really put it together this year with a great manager, a great pitching staff, some great offense and some great defense. Reggie Jackson led the offense with 32 homers, while the rotation featured Catfish Hunter and his 21 and 11 record. Still, neither future Hall of Famer was the A's biggest story in 1971. Blue has shown baseball fans around the world that he is the complete pitcher. He certainly took, I think, our game by storm that particular year. Blue has faced seven, retired seven. He just dominated everything. In a total of 312 innings, this brilliant left-hander walked only 88 batters while striking off 301. And that seems to attract a lot of attention of the fans. Vida, roaring, whirling, and devouring batting averages pulls the crowds. Attendance was always high everywhere he pitched. We go into a town, the press is going to want to interview me before I pitch, and they're going to say I'm the greatest this, the greatest that. And a lot of people read this, and they come out, and they see for themselves, am I really human? Is it really true? Is it happening? It was happening, all right. And when Blue and his 22-5 and five record appeared on the cover of Time magazine in August, it was confirmation Vida had transcended his sport. TV shows and the newscast and all that was speaking about Vida Blue. I like the publicity. It's nice to be able to go to, into a town and have so many thousands of people to know who you are. The people just loved him. Just his name just, just brought in a lot of people, and he signed, a, I guess, a million signatures that year. Vida Blue changed the league. They called the American League the junior circuit, but he changed it. When he started winning those games, he brought in an extra 10, 15, 20,000 people. He really helped the American League that year. Every so often, the exploits of an athlete gripped the nation. In 1971, Blue's mix of blazing fastball and electric personality enraptured America. In the process, he became the youngest pitcher ever to win both the MVP and Cy Young. I just happened to fall into this thing. I didn't go out to pitch to be a star. I just went out to pitch as hard as I could every time I pitched. And some kind of way that translated into me having a great season in 71. 71 would also prove memorable for a pair of iconic sluggers, as Harmon Killebrew and Frank Robinson 
both hit late summer milestone home runs. We played a doubleheader against the Detroit Tigers, and I hit number 499 in the first game. So I went in and told the clubhouse kid, I said, order the champagne, because I'm going to hit the 500 in the second game of this doubleheader. Robinson delivered on his promise as he connected in the ninth inning off Tiger pitcher Fred Sherman. Cuellar, into his windup, delivers. A curveball's going on. It's a high fly ball. Hit into deep left field. It's back deep. It's going, going. Number 500 for Harm Killebrew. 40-year-old Willie Mays had no milestone home runs in 71, and after hitting 11 homers through May, he managed to hit only seven more for the remainder of the year. Having the older players, they're not going to have that energy level or stamina at the end of the season that they had in the beginning. The Giants built a 10 and a half game lead by the end of May, and they were surprised. Nobody expected them to do that well, and they hit a wall. I know the pitchers throwing so many games, we used to get tired. Gail and I was on the mound every every four days with three-day rest, and it's not easy to do that the whole year. For the slumping Giants, fatigue wasn't limited to their older players. Their young shortstop was feeling it as well. Chris Spire at the time was 19 years old, and one of the things that Charlie Fox did as a manager was he played him every day, and by August, you could almost see his tongue hanging on the infield ground. He just ran out of gas. From June on, the Giants were five games under 500, and a terrible September provided some pennant race drama. They lost 16 of their last 24 games and allowed the Dodgers to get back in it. On the final day of the season, Juan Marichal needed to defeat the Padres to guarantee that the Giants would win their division. The lead had shrunk to just one game. You always had a chance with Marichal. His winning percentage was off the charts, so you were in a good situation. Marichal answered the call with a 5-1 to one win. Bittersweet for the Giants as their near collapse impacted their chances in the NLCS against Pittsburgh, a team they dominated all season. They had to use Marichal on the final day of the season. Therefore, he wasn't able to pitch in games one and two in San Francisco. That seemed of little consequence as Gaylord Perry and the Giants continued their regular season mastery over the Bucs by winning game one of the playoffs five to four. We dominated the Pirates all year head-to-head, -head, but Bob Robertson had the playoffs of his life. The slugging first baseman blasted three game two homers and drove in five runs in a 9-4 Pirate route. He'd had another long ball and a game three win, and the Pirates went on to win the series in four, reaching their first fall classic since 1960. Over in the American League, the playoffs would pit new versus old school. Baltimore Orioles, we knew they were going to be tough starting staff that they had. Uh, and, you know, they were winning 20 games, so we knew we had our hands full. For them to come in and knock off the Baltimore Orioles, that would have been a big feather in their hat. But it was instilled in us that if we do our job, nobody can beat us. The series would play out as expected. Oakland's young and brash team wasn't quite ready for greatness, and the O's would sweep their way to their third straight World Series. The Orioles have been established a 2-1 to one favorite to win this World Series. Why not? They've got four 20-game winners. They won 100 games again during the season. It's a beautifully balanced baseball machine. We felt pretty good about playing the Pirates, and we felt we could beat the Pirates. After all, World Series are often won with pitching, and the Orioles were the team with four 20-game winners. The Pirates had none, which made for an apparent mismatch. Ever since the first day of spring training, everybody has told me my pitching hasn't been strong enough. And here it is, uh, we're in the October Classic. Even the heart and soul of the Pirates was coming under fire. Number 21, Roberto Clemente. One of the players on the Orioles said that Clemente was overrated and he wasn't as good as some of the other players in the league. And I think that kind of got under Roberto's skin. So with perceived disrespect as a backdrop, Game one pitted 19-game winner Doc Ellis against Baltimore's Dave McNally. The O's didn't look like defending champs in the top of the second, allowing three unearned runs on only one hit. Belanger is going to third, and it's the runner, Robertson. 
goes into the dugout. Bob Robertson scores. In the bottom of the frame, Frank Robinson's blast. That one is going in. It is gone. A home run for Frank Robinson. Seem to open the door for more Orioles long ball. So the Orioles have runners on first and second, and Murr Rettman up. There they drive into deep left field. Way back. And that ball is gone. And the Orioles take the lead four to three. Dave McNally settled down, retiring 19 straight batters, en route to a complete game three hitter. The game is over. Final score, the Orioles five, the Pirates three. It was expected, let's put it that way. It was sweet. Game two was all Baltimore, as the Orioles ran roughshod over the Pirates. Set up the middle by Brooks Robinson. In the score, Paul Blair, 11 to nothing, Baltimore. Despite the 11 to 3 blowout, the Pirates' gifted right fielder, Roberto Clemente, made a captivating late game statement. There's a high fly in the right. Long chase for Clemente. Gallops over. Grabs it, whirls. Here's Rettman coming to throw. What a throw! And he just beat him in. The runner was safe. But well, you had to just sit there and look at that play and say, that's special. What a magnificent throw from Clemente. He couldn't have carried it over there any better. And Rettman just did get there. We had lost the first two games, and Baltimore was on a roll. They had won the last 11 regular season games. They swept their playoffs. So you know how they're feeling, full of confidence. But Danny Murtaugh did say after the second game, you haven't seen the real Pirates yet. And when the scene shifted to Pittsburgh for game three, Pirate pitchers began to assert themselves. I thought that we were going to win that series after we won those first two games, but we ran into Steve Blass. Blass was fantastic through six innings, allowing only one harmless single. He pitched some great baseball against us. Kept throwing me curveballs, and I couldn't hit him. What a changeup. Nursing a one-run lead in the bottom of the seventh, the Pirates had two aboard, nobody out, hoping to add an insurance run. And the batter will be Bobby Roberts. I go walking up to the plate, and I had to look down at Frank Osiak. Coach Frank Osiak flashing the bunt sign. He was given the bunt sign by Frank Osiak, our third base coach. Not once, but twice. I didn't see no sign. I don't think he ever knew the bunt sign. I don't know if he ever bunted in his life. So oblivious to the bunt sign, he went ahead and swung away. That ball's hit very deep to right field. It's going way back. It is gone. I get back to the dugout, and Bill Mazeroski taps me on the leg. He said, hey, Rob, did you know the bunt sign was on? I said, what? So I had to look down at the bench down there, and there's Murtaugh down there. He's got his hat down, and he's just laughing. The Pirates leading 5-1, to one, one out away from the first victory of the series for the Pirates. There's a drive right down to Cash on a short hop. The Buckos win. Look at Blanche. And he pitched a magnificent three-hitter today. And while a World Series three-hitter was certainly nothing new, something about Game 4 was. And it's our pleasure to welcome you to the very first night game in World Series history. We've had 397 World Series games played before this one, all in the daytime. And here we are for this historic event. The starting pitcher, 20-game winner, Pat Dobson for Baltimore. And Luke Walker won 10 games and lost eight. It looked as though the Orioles would own both Walker and the Knight. Dispatching the Pirates starter in the first inning. The drive is run down by Oliver at the warning track, but it's good for a 3-0 lead. Trailing 3-0 and down two games to one, the Pirates rolled the dice with a 21-year-old rookie. Well, Bruce Kaysen had a very rocky time of it in game two. Over in Baltimore, I had a little trouble getting a ball over the plate. I threw nine pitches and eight of them were balls. I was very displeased with my performance. I walked to Palmer with the bases loaded. And I knew I had to come in the game and throw strikes and get the ball over the plate, and luckily that's what I did. Not only did Keeson throw strikes. This kid looks good. But he dramatically turned the game and the series around, blanking the O's for six and a third innings, allowing no walks and only one hit. Bruce gave us a big lift. When you come in being down like that, you're asked to hold him, and he did exactly that. He gave us an opportunity to come back. Behind Al Oliver's second RBI of the game, the Pirates tied the game at three. Then pinch hitter Milt May had a chance to untie it in the seventh.
And when Dave Jesty closed it out, the series was even, and the 1971 season was down to a best of three. Pivotal Game 5 in Pittsburgh would once again favor Baltimore, with 21-game winner Dave McNally opposing spot starter Nelson Bryles. I was hurt last game of the season, was supposed to pitch a playoff game and couldn't. And Murtai, even though I'd been off of the pitching mound for more than 10 days, still gave me the ball. Bryles took the ball and never gave it back. Allowing only two Baltimore singles, Bryles spun a masterful 4-0 shutout. Bryles on the 1-2, Sex throws. Here's a ground trickler well inside the bag of third. Pagan throws the second. The ball game is over. Pittsburgh wins game five of the World Series 4-0. Now ahead, three games to two, one Pirate was drawing little attention despite a 12-game World Series hitting streak. And that ball's off the wall. Roberto Clemente had hit safely in all seven games in 1960, plus five so far in 71. There's a base hit to right. Clemente continues to play brilliantly in every department in this game. Typically, Clemente had flourished in the Fall Classic without receiving much attention, at least until game six. That was his time to show the whole baseball world what we've been seeing around here for 20-some years. We're watching Buford, and he cannot get to it. Here is Clemente again, on his way for three, and Clemente has tripled. It was his showcase, it was his World Series. Couldn't take my eyes off him. I mean, it was like there was a spotlight, an aura around him. Now a homer in the third. It's his 11th hit and first homer of the series. And the Pirates lead two to nothing. It was a coming out party for him. He showed the world exactly what he was capable of. It showed the five tools that he had. Tool number five, his arm, which saved the winning run from scoring in the ninth. Belanger's on his way around second. Clemente with a great arm comes up with it. Belanger stops to third as the throw comes home on one hop. Picked it up and threw maybe a better strike to Sanguin on one hop than I had thrown. It was a treat to watch him, and it was a treat for baseball fans to watch what he was capable of doing. And somehow, Clemente's brilliant game six was not enough to offset the will of the defending champion. Ball is hit out the center field. Avalio on short center field. Robinson tags. Here comes the throw. It is up the line. Hey, we go to seven games. It was a tremendous game. It was a must game for us, and we battled all the way. This is something you dream about all your life, the seventh game of the World Series. You think you'll have any trouble sleeping at night? I'm sure of it. You will have trouble. <laughs> you darn right. Game seven is... Everything they say it is times 10. Steve Blast gets a second crack at the Orioles, and there are symptoms of wildness in the Blast delivery. And Weaver picks this spot to challenge Blast on a technicality. 801, rule 801. When Mr. Weaver came out in the first inning and delayed the game on some rule that I didn't even know about, I was actually so nervous, I appreciated him stopping the game so I could get over that case of the nerves. He's pitching from the side of the rubber. He's got to pitch from the front of the rubber. I got so upset with him, I forgot how nervous I was. Blast settled down to the tune of only two hits allowed through seven shutout innings. Out on that slow Mike Cuellar was almost as good, hurling three and two-thirds innings of perfect baseball. But then he had to stare down a rather torrid pirate hitter. Here's Bobby Clemente. Bounced it short his first time up. Hit the screw ball a mile in the left center field. In the eighth inning, each team tallied a run, making the score two to one Pirates. It was nip and tuck all the way, but received to shut those guys down in the last game at their building was some kind of a performance. Right up the middle, Hernandez is back at second base, throws from there, and that's the series. Pittsburgh wins. Look at Glass. Glass has hit the Pirates to the World Championship. This is emblematic of the World Championship in 1971, and I think your team has earned it as a championship squad that came from behind to win like champions. In winning the series MVP award, Roberto Clemente had showcased every one of his five tools, proving once and for all that he was indeed the great one. Perhaps the trademark moment for Hispanic Americans, for people of the Caribbean, came at the end of the series. The greatest right fielder in the game of baseball, Roberto Clemente. Bobby, congratulations on a great World Series. Thank you, Bob. When the first thing he did as Bob Prince interviewed was asked 
to speak to his parents, to seek their blessings and benediction, and to speak in Spanish. En el día más grande de mi vida, para los nenes, la bendición mía y que mis padres me echen mi bendición en Puerto Rico. Mr. and Mrs. Clemente, we love them too. Sometimes the good Lord smiles on you and gives you your moment in the sun. The 1971 season and the 1971 World Series was finally the opportunity given Roberto to display the quality individual that he was and the quality player that he was. He certainly took advantage of it and all the world could see that he was special. Thanks to a transcendent effort by Roberto Clemente, the Pirates were champions. Despite their loss, Baltimore would win more games in the 70s than any other AL team, and their 420 game winners in 71 have stood the test of time, as no pitching staff has approached this remarkable feat. The last team to boast 320 game winners would be the 73 A's with Catfish Hunter, Ken Holtzman, and Vita Blue, at the core of three straight world championships, beginning in 1972. For Roberto Clemente, 1972 would tragically be his final season. And he seemed to sense that one year earlier when asked about the timeline for collecting his 3,000th hit. You never know. I, I, uh, if I'm alive, like I said before, you never know because God tells you how long you're going to be here. So you never know what can happen tomorrow. Everybody said everyone Bobby to get that big number 3,000. Bobby hit the drive. Clemente's haunting premonition came true three months later. While attempting to deliver aid to earthquake-stricken Nicaragua, Roberto's plane crashed off the coast of Puerto Rico. Today, Clemente's legacy is as strong as ever, one that was cemented on baseball's grandest stage in 1971.